and he now directs the Fikret Yüksel Foundation, which is based in Istanbul, Turkey. So he aims to spread the first robotics competition and its values throughout Turkey. I'll now be handing it over to him um, so that he can deliver this presentation. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me. Uh, thank you to Manan and Lavanya for hosting and to Team Elevate for putting this together. Uh, I'm excited to be with you guys today. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring up a presentation that I have. Um, give me one second. Should work now. All right. Um, so, as mentioned, I come from Washington State. Uh, I was on Team 360 from 2005 to 2009. Uh, from there, I moved to um, the other IIT. I believe you guys have an IIT that's very famous within your own country. Um, I went to different IIT, the Illinois Institute of Technology, um, where I studied architecture. And at the same time, I volunteered uh, a lot. I, I spent a lot of time helping with all three programs in Illinois while I was there. And then I moved uh, to Turkey. Um, a little more about my past. Um, this photo is a little blurry because it's old. Sorry about that. But this is a, a picture of Team 2905, which was Turkey's first FRC team, and Team 360 uh, celebrating together at the end of the uh, Microsoft Seattle Regional in 2009. Um, when I was on the team, I started my first year. I did mechanic works, and I was learning design on the computer. I had decided I wanted to be an architect long before I got to high school and uh, my mother told me when I got to high school you were going to join some clubs and learn to be social and do something besides what you're doing now and so I joined I went to the club fair I joined four clubs to my mom's surprise the one that I could find that was closest to architecture was robotics which isn't that close but at my school that was as close as I got so I joined robotics and figured I could at least learn the computer design programs that way and I'd always been interested in science and technology so it seemed like a good fit and I joined that and I didn't know what I was getting myself into but it was worth it for sure uh, so the first year I did mechanics and learned computer design the second year, I worked on the animation, which I, to be honest, I utterly failed at. I learned a lot from failing, that's for sure. Um, that year, the, the, they don't have uh, annual animation contests anymore within FIRST in this way. Um, before, there was a safety animation and another thematic animation, and I believe they got rid of the thematic animation. But... That year, the thematic animation was about what, what can we do to make the world a better place in terms of climate and um, being more energy conscious, et cetera. And as I lived in Seattle, I thought, well, I can just talk about what my city's doing and stuff and make an animation about it. I was going to make a fly-through animation flying through downtown Seattle and explaining what we're doing there. In that would have been 2006 and 2007. My idea was a lot bigger than my computer. So that never really got finished. I would get chunks of it done and then the computer would crash. I learned to save frequently, which is something you should all remember to do when you're using computers. Although they're much more stable now than they were back then, still save all the time. Um, and, uh, by the end of it, the computer could barely render the freeway. So basically, I never really got that done. But it was a great learning experience for me. I learned a lot. 
and I did other things on the team the first two years as well. I was the team's test dummy. If they needed somebody to test the shooter at, I was the one they'd shoot at to stop the balls from hurting tools or <laughs> other things. Um, this, my second year was uh, the ro robots had the lift things and I was about the exact weight of a robot with the battery. So they tested the lift by putting me on it. Um, I, I made it without injury, which is, which is good. Uh, it was fun, definitely. My third and fourth years on the team, I ran the team, uh, which was a lot of fun and definitely a crazy learning experience. Um, probably the biggest thing I learned out of the program was how to work with people, how to try to convince people to do things that they need to do that you want them to do. That's incredibly difficult. And I still struggle with that to this day, but I would be much, much worse at it had I not been on my team, let me tell you. Um, at the end of my second year, my mother had come to the competitions and my family is connected with Turkey through my grandfather and my mother. And my grandfather went to an orphanage school in Turkey uh, and um, my mother grew up in Turkey. And my grandfather left his estate to support education in Turkey. And so my mom saw me going through the program and then my sister followed me into it afterwards. And she was like, wow, this does so much for everybody in the program. I've never seen young people having so much fun without alcohol and things that harm them. Um, she was very impressed. And so she decided that uh, we would, with the, we were donating every year to the school with our donation from then on, we would direct it to be sent to the robotics team specifically. And that's the blue guy, the light blue guys in this photo. The dark blue guys is my team. The light blue guys is uh, the team from Darshafaka. And of course, once we started one team, we were like, well, we should start more teams over there. So we helped slowly as teams got started. In 2009, I moved to Illinois to start my university degree, where for one year I mentored an FTC and an FRC team, which is incredibly difficult. Uh, you guys should definitely be nice to your mentors. That's not an easy job. To be honest, I'm not convinced I was the greatest mentor ever because I was a freshman in college and I was pretty clueless, but I feel like I helped a little bit, at least for the kids. The other mentors definitely wanted me to return the next year, but I needed to focus on my school and do, I took on a lot of volunteer roles. Um, don't overextend yourself. That's another important thing because when you do overextend yourself, you end up doing a bad job at most of the things you're trying to do. Be, be calculated and be considerate about how much you take on and make sure that it's an amount that you are capable of completing. Um, like taking on architecture school, mentoring, and trying to help run the programs in the region. That's, and also I was pledging a fraternity, which is just as hard as the other three. <laughs> Don't take on that much at once. It just isn't good for you. Some people can do it, maybe, but be careful about how much you take on because uh, you, you will enjoy it more when you have time to do it properly. That's for sure. That's something I learned in architecture school. Ironically, not in my architecture classes. I took a separate class that is supposed to be a class that makes people from different degrees mix together and work on stuff. And I built tons of models in architecture school, tons. For this class, I had a whole semester to build a model. Before that, I really dreaded making models because it's hard. It takes up a lot of time. And I never felt like I had enough time to do a good job. But in that class, I had a semester to build one model. 
and I, me and my partner, we had time to work it out, figure out what we wanted to do, do a really good job of it. And I was really proud of that model and I had fun building it, much more fun than I had building models in two days for Architecture Studio. So be careful about how you manage your time. That's something that this will help you learn as well. Um, and you'll learn that one, you'll, you'll learn throughout your life, but something to be careful about. I also, while I was in Illinois, joined the Regional Planning Committee there to help put together the Chicago Regional, uh, Midwest Regional is the official name. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, working with, um, in the Midwest region, it's mostly fairly older adults running things. So I got to meet people who, to be honest, I don't interact with that much. When you go to college, you mostly interact with people who are like 18, 19, 20, 22, same age as you. On the committee, I got to interact with older people, which is really nice. Um, keeping balance in your life, interacting with various different people helps you learn better, for sure. Part of why it's important to have mentors and listen to them. They are not the same age as you. They have different experiences than you do, and they have very valuable insights into life. Um, I also joined the robotics team in college, uh, mainly to be close to other FIRST alumni and because that robotics team did a lot of volunteerism. And building the robot was never really my thing when I was on a team. Uh, I dealt with the other side of what the team does, the PR elements, the going out and doing community service. That was more my thing while I was on the team. And so that's what I did when I was on the college team as well. The college team was half there to be a first alumni and volunteering group and half there to build robots. And so I stuck with the philanthropy side, which was a lot of fun for me. And I got to meet good friends that uh, I still talk to many of them every Sunday now. Uh, since the pandemic started, we started having Sunday night meetings online, which has been really good because I'd kind of lost touch with them and I guess a silver lining in a crappy situation. Um, when I graduated college, my plan was to head back to Seattle and become an architect. Shortly before graduating, I was sitting at uh, the airport in Seattle with my mother and my dad. Uh, we had the robot kits for three or four Turkish teams in our luggage because uh, as I'm sure the teams who exist in India, Team Elevate knows the customs is a pain. And it's much easier to just put the kit in your luggage and fly and sometimes it's cheaper, which is crazy, but that's how it is. Um, so that's what my family was doing every year. And I was lucky to be able to come to Istanbul every Christmas break, bring the robot kits over, meet whichever teams were forming that year and head back to my school. So I was in the airport waiting to do that with my family. And uh, I was telling my mother, I'm ready to move back to Seattle, find an architecture job, stop flying between three different cities all the time because I'm from Seattle, Chicago's like 2000 miles away, Istanbul's another 4,000 miles away. And I was flying between the three of them often enough that it was, don't take this the wrong, but it's a lot of fun traveling, no doubt. It's very valuable experience. But if you travel a lot, it puts a lot of strain on your interpersonal relationships in any one place. You're never there, you miss things with people. And so there's that side of things. And that side of things had really started to get to me after six years of not really living in one city. And so that's what I, I was telling my mother about that. And she, I finished speaking and she was then like, well, how about moving to Istanbul instead and uh, running the foundation and trying to start more teams? And that definitely wasn't in my plan. And I told my mom I would think about it. 
And uh, based on where I'm sitting, you can see what I chose. Uh, I moved here in 2015 and uh, started working with uh, my best friend who is also in this photo somewhere. Where is she? Uh, let me see if I can point her out. Ah, there she is. She's this one yelling. Um, that's Aisha. The two of us started working full-time for the foundation. We organized off-seasons for the first few years and regionals once we were allowed to. Uh, and it's been a great experience doing so. Our goal is to eventually see an FRC team in every high school in Turkey. We are, what are we? We're 1% of the way to our goal. There's about 10,000 high schools in Turkey and there's a little over 100 teams. So in five years, that's not bad progress. We have a long ways to go, but it's exciting and it's fun. Um, all right. So one of the main, the, the most important thing with FIRST, I think, is its core values, which are gracious professionalism and cooperation. This is in fact why my foundation chooses first and not say VEX or WRO. Those are all, all of them are great robotics competitions and will do a great job of teaching you skills and teamwork. But the other ones don't focus on gracious professionalism and cooperation the way first does. And that is to us the absolute most important value in this program. Um, the easy way to explain it is to say, Compete as if your grandmother is watching everything you do. If there's something you're doing that you think your grandmother would not be happy with, don't do it. Um, in this way, we, we give the competition the best we have, always. We work as hard as we can, we give it our best effort. But at the same time, you're always respectful and helpful to the other competitors. Everybody is there to learn. It's not a beat each other up and win by doing the most damage to your opponent competition. It is a win the competition against the best version of your opponent type of place. Um, damaging your opponent is absolutely forbidden in this program. Uh, you are encouraged to work with your opponent because again, we're all here to learn and working together we learn far more than we ever could by working separately and doing separate things. Um, one of the things my mentor always told us, uh, his, one of his famous quotes is, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Uh, and experience is extremely valuable. You may not win the highest award, you may not your robot might be having a hard time, but you will have still learned incredible skills, both technical and interpersonal skills, which are all incredibly important. Something I learned while I was in university, actually, uh, on my college robotics team. I, personally, I am a fairly, I'm not, super introverted, but I'm a fairly introverted person. I shy away from too much social interaction. I got to my college robotics team and I was the most social person in the group, which is a little bit scary. Uh, I'm social, but I'm not that social. Something I learned there was you can have the greatest idea in the world, but if you cannot present it, it doesn't matter because nobody is going to take it on and run with it. You have to be able to convince somebody else that it's the greatest idea in the world and to do something about it. Uh, so that's something to remember. The social skills you learn in this program are just as important as the technical ones. The, they go hand in hand and you need both. Um, and one of the most important things in this whole thing is that, that we help each other all the time. Uh, 
there are regular occurrences of teams who get to the finals, their opponent breaks down, they run over and get the the one team runs over and gives their opponent a, a part they need to fix their robot. And then that team beats them. And that's that's wonderful. Nobody's upset. Everybody played against the best version of that they could and they had a fair game, a fun game, and they they worked together and they learned. And that's the most important thing. And that leads me to my next topic, which is awards. Um, this is a very strange looking slide probably to talk about awards, but I will explain it. Uh, the biggest award in first and the one worth pursuing is your own growth, friendship, teamwork, skills, and knowledge. For me, what I've won out of this program is self-confidence, uh, I've, I've learned many technical skills and I've also gained friends. Um, here on the left, you see me in 2008 and me in 2019. In 2008, I look a little shy and held back. In 2019, I'm a bit more confident and sure of myself. On the right, you see a photo from a high school dance of mine that we took 2905 to that has both Aisha and I in it. And then you see us 10 years later at Aisha's wedding, where I was her maid of honor, which is a little odd, but our friendship's odd, so that's how it is. Um, Aisha's my best friend. And that's one of the things I've won out of this program, is a best friend, a new place to live, a new experience, I'm learning a new language because of this program, which is incredibly difficult. Uh, it's, it's very valuable what, uh, what you learn out of this and the friends you make along the way. Um, the awards that the events will give you are great. Uh, it's a lot of fun to win awards, no doubt. Uh, my team won a fair few, including chairman's my senior year. There's no doubt that that's fun, but that's not the main goal. The main goal here is to improve yourself and to improve the people around you. Um, to be honest, every team that shows up at a competition with a robot is a winner because you guys are like somewhere between 13 and 18 years old. You built a working electromechanical robot in somewhere between six and 10 weeks. When you walk into any engineering firm, they'll say, you did what? It, it's an incredible achievement. And just getting to the event with a robot, that's enough. That's really all you need to do. That, that should be your goal. You should obviously apply for the physical awards that require applications and whatnot, but don't make that your driving factor. Your driving factor should be learning for yourself, learning for your community, helping your community. Those are the things that you'll get more out of by far than any award that the event will give you, for sure. Uh, that, that's how it's been in my life. I get far more out of helping people than getting awards for it. The fun part is seeing other people learn and understand, seeing the light bulb turn on, hearing stories about, there's a, there's a mentor for uh, one of the teams here in Turkey. Uh, he, one of the parents of his students came uh, after school one day and was like, we need to talk. And uh, this guy was apparently a fairly large man, so the mentor was a little, the, the tone and circumstance made the mentor a little afraid, but he was like, okay, we, we can go into this room and chat. And uh, the father was like, what are you doing to my kid? We, we thought this kid was gonna do nothing with his life. He, he wasn't, he didn't care about school. He wasn't doing anything. He was just doing the bare minimum to get by. 
now he's like excited to go to school. He's doing his homework. He cares. What did you do? Hearing stories like that, that's the fun part of this. By far more than anything else. Hearing the way it's actually changed and improved other people's lives. Um, one other award that you will get out of this competition is uh, when you are going to apply for college later, there are many, many schools that have scholarships. And it does not matter if your team wins awards or not. All you have to do is be a part of the competition. That's the only requirement for applying for all of the scholarships available. And there, last time I looked, was something like $82 million of scholarships. Uh, mostly it's in United States universities. Uh, there's a couple in other places in the world, but it's still mostly in the U.S. Hopefully that'll expand beyond the U.S. soon. I know we're working to expand it here in Turkey, but it's, it's hard. But um, that is an incredible opportunity that this program affords you. And again, all you have to do is be a part of it. You don't have to win anything. Um, so that, that's a very, very important thing for you for later on. Um, and I included this. This is uh, some of the things that you win for yourself by joining this competition. Uh, this is the rate at which students experienced uh, gains in these subjects. Um, they in increased their interest in doing STEM activities. They increased their self-confidence, 92%. Their teamwork skills, 99% seen increase in that. Solving disagreements, which that one is hard. Um, but you learn to do it through this program. These things are incredibly important. Uh, I still very much struggle with solving disagreements. I'm very lucky that I have Aisha with me because she's a magician with disagreements and I can just call her unless I have a disagreement with her and then things are fun. But um, that's an important skill and one that I honestly wish I was better at even today. Um, so that was Another thing about this program that is important is uh, volunteerism, uh, giving back. This program is completely impossible without volunteers. The events run with crews of around 150 people, uh, of which maybe uh, one or two are employees. Um, this is completely impossible without volunteers. Uh, when we started in 2015 in Turkey, we came, we talked to the eight teams that existed at the time. We said, we want to run an off season. We need volunteers. We, Tur the U.S. has a fairly strong culture of volunteerism. Turkey doesn't have the same thing. So we really didn't know where to go other than to the teams. And as you can see from the picture, look at their faces, they're all your age. Most of them were either still in high school or in their first year of college, and they showed up to volunteer. Uh, the, the ones who are older than that are either my family, Aisha's family, or alumni of my team that came, and my mentor, the crazy-haired guy here, that's Eric Stokely, he's my mentor. They showed up to help out. Uh, and this is impossible without volunteers. So that's something to consider as you go through the program and graduate. Come back and help out so that more people can experience the same gains that you did. Uh, it's a lot of fun to help out anyways. It's a great social experience. And of course, alongside event volunteers, you have the mentors, which you see on the right, a slightly darker photo. Uh, these guys give insane hours to help you guys out. Um, and their insights, their knowledge, 
knowledge of life, knowledge of technical things. It's amazing. Uh, listen to them. They're smart people. They're well-intentioned people. They're wonderful. Um, so that they they really are important. And again, without them, this program's impossible. They're they're your guide to how to build a robot, how to run a team. Uh, they help you handle the finances and organization. That they, they'll help you with anything. And remember always, they're giving their own time to do that. They could be home with their family, but they're choosing to help you because they love you. So return that for them. Be nice. They're, it's worth it. Uh, and many of the mentors who are actually alumni who come back once they graduate, my suggestion on that, however, is if you go back to mentor, try not to mentor your own team. Or if you mentor your own team, wait four years until everybody you knew on the team has graduated. That tends to work out better as a mentor. Mentoring a team you were a part of with people you know on it can get really confusing the mentor-student relationship. Uh, if you want to mentor in your first four years off your team, my suggestion is to mentor a different team. But some people make it work. It's obviously up to the individual, but pardon. That's, that's my suggestion for uh, if you want to come back and mentor. Uh, and the last thing I have in my presentation is a video that I want to show you to remind you that this whole thing is about having fun. And uh, also, we enjoy Dollar Mendy over here in Turkey, too. That guy's a lot of fun. So that's what I have for my presentation. Um, I hope that it's helpful to you guys. It uh, leaves you with something useful to take forward as you guys start teams and start competing. Um, it was a lot of fun for me on a team. It's still, it was a lot of fun for me as I volunteered and now as a full-time employee working on this, it's still a lot of fun. It's a, it's a labor of love. It has its ups and downs for sure. Some days, some days, I don't know, but most of the days are good. Most of the days, it's a very fun job. And especially during the competition, meeting the kids, meeting the teams, or on days where we have demonstrations and uh, teams bring their robots and we get to talk with the teams, watch them interact, talk with their mentors. It's amazing fun. There's one picture I have that I, I don't have on hand, but I'll, I'll describe it from our first off season. Uh, back then there was bag and tag and um, we didn't have official systems for it, but what we had teams do is take pictures of their robot once it was bagged, before they bagged it and after they bagged it, and send us the photos so we could ensure that they didn't work on the robot between the um, closing of the bag and the starting of the competition. One team sent us this photo of their robot. Their robot was a trash can attached to a drive base. It was clearly not going to be a great robot, but the smile on the kid's face, he was, it was his robot. He was proud of it. And uh, that photo really, if, if when I'm having a bad day, I go find that photo and look at it and remember why I'm doing this. 
that team also uh, used the bus to get to the competition, which uh, most teams usually find like a school van or something to get them there. This team, they had the bus. That's what they got. Uh, but they found a way. They made it. And they had a lot of fun. They were a good team. Uh, so that's that's all I have for my presentation. I believe I can start with questions now. Right, so now we'll be moving on to the question and answer session. So um, whatever questions you have, um, the audience, please just add them to the chat. You have access to that. And it can be about anything, right? It can be about STEM. It can be about first. It can be about the journey that got him to where he is. Um, whatever questions you have, feel free to write them there. And we have a few questions of our own, so we'll begin with that. And you, know, you were talking about volunteerism, right? So along those lines, what inspired you towards building teams and working towards a regional in Turkey? So when we first started, uh, we were supporting one team, which was fairly easy to do. Uh, slowly, other teams started, and we were helping some of them out as we learned about them or as they needed extra help. As it started to grow, we realized how ridiculously expensive it is to travel to the U.S. and back to compete. And so we, we realized that somehow we needed to get a regional started in Turkey if we really wanted more high schools to be able to join. Uh, the program's expensive even just in country. Uh, that is one of the only downsides of it. It is incredibly expensive. But removing the cost of travel to the US has opened up the ability for so many more teams to be able to compete. And that was really the driving factor for starting a regional here in Turkey. Um, it's The other thing is um, the way people, it is very difficult to describe this competition without seeing it in person and convincing sponsors and education department people and whatnot to come to the US to see the competition is difficult because it's time off. It's a 10 hour time difference. They're gonna be sleeping in the middle of the day while they're trying to watch the competition. It's expensive. Having events in Turkey allowed us to bring people to Istanbul instead of half a world away and show them because Showing, like I said, showing this competition is worth talking about it for two weeks. People show up, they walk into the building, they see kids dancing, they see kids driving robots, and they understand very quickly. Uh, seeing it is everything. So having it physically in country is incredibly important, and that's one of the things we realized. And those were the those were why we worked so hard to get a regional started here as quick as we could, which still took six, seven, eight years, eight years, 2009 to 2017, 18, eight or nine years. It took a while. Right. So what would you say were the key challenges you faced um, while you were trying to do this? Key challenges. Well, let's see. Definitely customs is up there. Uh, I think you guys have the same problem, but um, customs is an incredibly big challenge. And to be honest, we haven't entirely solved that one. We just live with it. Uh, other challenges, before having the off season in Turkey, explaining to teams, convincing them to jump, take the leap, go for it, it's really hard. Um, Getting people to see it was hard. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to convince a deputy minister of education for the city of Istanbul to come to the US in 2015. And that really helped us get teams going because once he saw it, he understood it. He was our guy in the education department from then on because he saw the value of it. And it's worked out well for him too. He's been rising through the education department since. Um, so it worked for both of us. 
So you'd say that the involvement of legislators and policymakers makes a big impact. Definitely, uh, especially here in Turkey. Uh, I'm gonna guess things are a bit similar in India, not so much in the US. The US is a bit different than here. But like in Istanbul, there's 81 public school districts. That's it, one for every province. And if you convince the province, it's worth it. That's like in Istanbul, that's 1200 schools under their control. Uh, and they'll send a letter to every one of those schools every year for you. That just doing something like that is an incredible foot in the door. At least they get exposure to it. Um, and then you can go and talk to them and they'll have an idea what you're talking about. And having permission from the Board of Education is incredibly important. I'm guessing it's similar for in India. Uh, the permission to take time off of school to go to the competition, super important. Without permission, it's hard to convince most schools, but if the Board of Education says, yes, this is an improved activity, problem solved. You also mentioned that um, it's really necessary to actually see um, the competition to, be, to understand how energetic the atmosphere is, right? So without showing children um, the actual competition, how do you attract them to FIRST or to STEM in general? That's harder. Um, my suggestion is to take the robot. You don't get to show them the whole atmosphere. Take videos. Uh, videos are a poor substitution for reality, but they, they help. And take a physical robot and drive it around and find a big enough space that you can let them safely drive it around so they experience it themselves. That, uh, that's what got me on the team, watching my the team I joined drive the robot around in the gathering area in our school. Um, wow, that's an awesome robot. That robot was dead last that year, but it still looks awesome. I, don't, I didn't know it was dead last when I saw it driving around the quad. It was just a really cool robot. Like, hey, I can be a part of that, why not? Um, so that, that helps a lot. Uh, that's, when my team was recruiting, that's what we always did. We took the robot to school assemblies. Uh, we took it to public events if we could when we were trying to start more teams. That seeing a robot is really interesting and it drags people in. And that's what we do here in Turkey too. We, we convince teams to bring their robots to big events like Technofest. Uh, that's really helped us start teams and draw people in. So, so far we've spoken of robotics as an extracurricular. How do you think we or other schools can incorporate robotics within the school curriculum? Or in the first place, should we even be incorporating robotics within curriculum? That's a tough question. For FRC, I'm not entirely sure. FLL and FTC are developing in school curriculum that seems to be very strong. Um, but they're also much cheaper and much more accessible and much more reasonable in the classroom. FRC, there's aspects that can be incorporated into the curriculum, but in my view, a lot of the value of it comes from being extracurricular, being a team activity, not a class activity. I think that sets a different environment for it to exist in that helps helps more with the soft skills. A classroom is tends to end up being more lecture, less hands-on. The extracurricular is all about the students doing something, less about being taught, more about learning by doing, which is really important. Um, so for the next few questions, we'll be for focusing on Turkey itself because we believe India and other countries with up and coming STEM communities could actually follow similar paths, right? So what kind of role do you think STEM will play in Turkey's future? Um, or what kind of a role is it playing right now? STEM is not playing anywhere near important enough of a role in Turkey's current situation. Uh, 
um, and that that's going to change country to country depends on who's running the country unfortunately um, I won't go too deeply into how things are in Turkey in that sense but it should play a much more important role in how Turkey goes forward for sure um, and it's it's important everywhere uh, the our our future is in advanced technology and robotics and um those those things are going to make us humans have much easier lives very quickly uh they have already very very quickly improved our lives in unbelievable ways but it takes it's going to take more emphasis from national levels to get us to the point we should be at but that's that's tough um now we'll be moving to some more of the audience questions so lavanya will be asking you those okay so we have uh, an audience question asking okay this is a personal one what was your favorite aspect of frc my favorite aspect of frc is it's definitely the attitude of working together to learn together teams helping each other um old teams help new teams new teams help new teams this new team knows mechanics this new team knows electronics they get together and share in that way everybody learns as much as they can and they share they learn from each other they learn to be more social being as i said before being just being raw smart is great but being smart and being able to communicate is important and the mixing together that teams do in the process of exchanging information is incredibly important and the the attitude of gracious professionalism is by far my favorite thing about FRC it's right there here i've made a lot of friends in FRC too yeah. uh what do you propose what would you propose is the best way to market first and steam to schools and organizations that can depend a lot on the school the organization and the people specifically that you're talking to but like for companies what i would try to say to them is this is your future workforce uh these guys they're incredibly smart they're incredibly capable these are the people you're going to want to hire in 5 8 years when they graduate college or trade school or whatever they end up doing even straight out of high school you might want to hire them uh if not as employees as interns uh the these are the students you want to hire uh so investing in this is very useful for schools and organizations In my experience usually the kids on the robotics team are the best performing kids in the school whether it's self selected or not doesn't really seem to make much of a difference uh and this helps this helps instill a sense of community in everybody that joins it which i think is really important uh and i think that's definitely something that you should sell when you're trying to convince schools and potentially team running organizations to join this that for one thing the one of first slogans this is more than a robot the robot's awesome but so is everything else we do and the amount of different things you learn by being a part of this is just an insane leap for everybody who joins uh and you can also show them first longitudinal study um they have that on their website that it's a formal study by i can't remember the name of the university brandeis university that's it um and 
their study shows consistently that their comparison group is actually STEM kids, STEM kids who joined first and STEM kids who didn't. And the STEM kids who joined first show insane uh, benefit over the regular STEM kids. Uh, so just between that, it's insane. And so that is a useful resource, I think, in convincing schools and organizations to be a part of this. Show them the data. It's incredible. I think that's valuable advice we can all use when we're trying to get more teams into first. How do you think we could start a regional here in India the way you did in Turkey, drawing on your personal experience? So, the way we got our regional started is, it took a while and I'm not gonna lie, it was very expensive. Um, what we did was we had gotten up to eight teams in 2015 when Aisha and I started working full time. Um, I highly recommend finding somebody that you can pay to do this full time to organize it because it's going to be very difficult without that, without somebody doing it full time. It'll, it'll be hard because even with the two of us doing it full time, we almost died. <laughs> we worked really hard and um, set up a committee of volunteers to help that paid individual or individuals. Um, here in Turkey, we've had since the beginning at least some level of a planning committee, similar to the way the US regionals are run. Uh, there's Today, there's like 45 people on our planning committee. Most of them are alumni, some of them are mentors, one or two are parents, some of them are people from industry who have judged with us before, who were really excited and want to help. But find a group of people who want to help and who want to give time to be part of a committee to do it, to help. Because that, there's, an unbelievable amount of work that goes into putting on these events and uh, it, you need a lot of people to put it on. Uh, once you have enough teams, uh, the way we started teams, so we had eight in 2015, you need, theoretically you can do events with like 16 or 20 teams. I highly recommend having at least 24. Uh, our first event we had 27. What we did was we bought 20 kits from the US, shipped them over, and we gave them to teams for like one tenth of the cost that we paid for them. It, it was expensive to us. Uh, we, and the reason we charged teams was so that they would show up, not because we wanted to charge registration. It was just, we're giving you this kit, we don't want you to run off with it and use it for something else. Uh, if you pay money to compete, you are much more likely to actually compete because it's new to them and they don't really know what they're getting into. Uh, that worked. 19 of the 20 teams competed. So we had 27 teams with the eight veterans. Uh, and we repeated that the next four years, uh, 20 teams a year for three years. And then we, I think we got 27 kits in 2018. At that point, we already had a regional. We did the off season because we were used to it and it's good practice for the teams. Uh, once everybody loves the off season, um, after 2018, we had enough teams that were strong enough that we let them run off seasons now. We don't run them ourselves because A, it's expensive, B, we can take the same amount of money and support teams directly with it. The off season had two goals, uh, starting new teams, because you need X number of teams in the country before you can have a regional. Second reason, get people to see the event in person. In 2018, we had our first regional because we finally had enough teams and first saw the off seasons and said, 
you look like you're competent, you know what you're doing, we'll let you run a regional. And so the 2018 off season was not necessary in the same way 2015, 16, and 17 were. But we did it because we were still trying to grow teams really fast, and it's honestly a really good way to keep growing teams. But uh, in 2019, we decided that it would be better to spend that kind of money on just directly supporting teams, especially since between 2018 and 2019, Turkey experienced a pretty serious financial crisis, and we're still experiencing a pretty serious financial crisis. So we felt that direct support to teams would be much more useful. And teams stepped up in the absence, and we had three off-seasons last year. Surprised me. <laughs> I figured we'd have maybe one team do it, but three teams decided they wanted to do it, and they did really high-quality off-seasons, which, I mean, I was expecting them to do the normal, like, American-style off-season. You show up in a gym for a day and have a field and, kind of run an off season two of the off seasons here pretty much were doing the same thing that we as the foundation did for two years which that was awesome one of them was a little lower in quality but still they did a great job they struggled more than the others for sure but it was an event the teams had fun they competed that's what matters in the end that's amazing how do you get teams good technical mentorship when you started out on this region and you're still building your teams? How do you get them good technical men mentorship? We still struggle with that. Um, what we try to do is uh, we're fortunate about what time kickoff is in Turkey. Kickoff is at 6.30 p.m. So what we try to do is have workshops for like five hours before the actual kickoff stream. And we call in alumni and companies that we know that help support us to come give workshops. But to be honest, the, the technical side, we still struggle a bit with in Turkey. Um, there's one or two good teams these days, like really good teams these days, which is nice and they help out. Hopefully they will keep helping out and spreading their knowledge to other teams and we will improve that way. Teams hold a lot of their own workshops from time to time, uh, which help because many teams join them. But that, that part's honestly hard and we haven't entirely solved that. Uh, for mentors, last year we started something new and we did a week-long education session uh, at the office building that we have. We're ha we have an office in a not too far from my house um, and it's in a really gigantic building like I think it's the 14th largest building in the world by square feet. Uh, it's a crazy place. They have conference areas. It's basically like an engineering mall and so the people that run it are all engineers and they very easily understand what we're doing which is good for us because we can walk up to them and say, hey, can we have a couple conference rooms to do some training? And they say, sure, have at it, go for it, which is really nice. It's really nice support from them. Uh, so we use those spaces to um, help hold uh, mentor training. And we called pretty much all of our sponsors and said, hey, can you send somebody from your company to train them in SolidWorks came and did 3D design training. There's a local industry group called Tezmaxan. They came and did training on like how to use blades and stuff like that. We have a safety company that supports us. They came and did a safety workshop. Aisha and I did workshops on first spirit and first values. Uh, and some of the alumni did workshops on like how to do a quick robot build so that the mentors at least have a base idea of how to build a robot. Because here a lot of the mentors are just science teachers and they don't know what they're getting into. And the training really, I think it really helped them this year. That was new for us and the mentors were really happy about it. Uh, it helped us start new teams because uh, we'd mostly aimed at mentors who were planning to start teams not necessarily veteran mentors but some veterans came and that went really well 
Okay. Hard. Sorry. My God. How do you self-sustain your teams without having them be part of a school or organization, like a community team or a neighborhood team? That I honestly couldn't tell you too much about. We have four, I think it's four community teams here in Turkey, but I don't know too much about their inner workings. I know it's very difficult for them not being part of an organization. Most of the school teams use their uh, family union to deal with their finances. The independent teams have a much harder time doing that. Some of them, I think one of them found a corporate sponsor that helps them handle their finances because that's the hardest part about being a community team is having no bank account, to my understanding. From what I've heard, from the bits and pieces I have heard from them, um, so there's three of us working here these days. Uh, one of them is Hassan Hoja. He's the one who interacts with the teams more and he knows more about that. I know less about that, unfortunately. So I can't give too good of an answer to that question. I'm sorry. How do you think first will impact the way students think and learn? How is it impacting them now? I think one of the greatest impacts it has is it instills, instills a sense of giving back into students. And I think that's really important. It, uh, how, how do I explain this well? Giving back to other people is really important. Going back, helping. I get this great opportunity uh, I could take that and run and just make my life good and be done with it. First students come back and say, no, my life is good. I want to make other people's lives good too. And that impact is incredible. I think that's helping to change communities all over. You see first teams on the news doing crazy things like building artificial legs for dogs who lost their legs or cats who lost their legs or building wheelchairs for people who can't afford to buy one. Those, those kind of things, like they impact the whole community and first students are much more civically minded and helpful. I think it makes them better people and I think that's really important. Okay. Would it be possible for you to discuss the kind of financial investments required to put up, uh, for you to put up in the initial years, the off season, and how much it's costing you currently? So it's a little complicated because uh, in dollars, the prices don't entirely make sense because the Turkish lira has changed so much. It's actually gotten cheaper for us every year, but that's not necessarily because we're doing less or, s but I, I can explain, like, if I remember right, the first off season cost us about $400,000, everything considered. We had to buy a field, we had to come up with an FMS, we had to buy a whole bunch of electronic equipment to run that, because back then we weren't using first FMS. We, my, my former teammates made their own FMS to run the first two off seasons. Um, what did we have to do? We had to do that. You have to rent an arena. You have to buy food for volunteers. Uh, we had to spend money for an office. Uh, somebody has to pay Aisha and I and Hassan. Um, what else? We had to fly a lot of volunteers over. Um, because you need experienced volunteers to run this. Uh, you could probably try to run it without flying anybody from abroad over, but it's not going to be a lot of fun if you try to do it that way. Uh, it's already, to be honest, the first two times, man, that was hard. And that was with people who knew what they were doing. Uh, scratch that, the first four times. These days, we're settled into it, and we, we have an idea what we're doing. We're we have a lot of people who've learned, but the first whole bunch of times were hard. Even with like 10 or 15 people who knew what they were doing, it's hard. 
because this is not an easy program to run. So, so we've been flying people over to help every year. That costs a fair amount of money. Um, I think we spend about $150,000 a year on kits and customs to uh, give to the teams. And I think we made back about, I don't know, maybe $10,000 in registration fees. Because like I said, the registration fees weren't meant to recuperate losses. They were just there to make sure teams showed up. Um, so it's, it's very expensive for sure. Uh, we're fortunate in the way our foundation is set up that it runs on the profits of a company in the U.S. that has been doing fine for many years. Uh, if we have a bad year over in the U.S., it's going to be fun here in Turkey. We'll figure it out, but um, we, we're very fortunate in that sense. But it's, as I said, it's a very expensive competition. Uh, these days, our events cost us about $150,000 in total. It's come a long ways down from $450,000, but part of that is that in 2015, the lira was $1 was 3 lira. Today, $1 is 7 lira. So that's been very helpful for us. Not so good for Turkey at all, but helpful for us since our finance comes from abroad. Okay. That will be the end of our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Alex, for everything. It's been a pleasure to hear, listen to you speak. You've given us a lot of valuable advice and your talk was very insightful. And I'm sure when I speak for myself, I'm also speaking for everyone else that we're going to be sitting at home with a lot more to think about after this. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to speak with you and I hope to see a whole bunch of you in March in Istanbul. Uh, inshallah, we'll actually have regionals this year. Um, and I hope to see you guys here in Istanbul then. Yes, thank you so much. This was super insightful and super helpful, Alex. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we will reach out to you for all kinds of advice going forward. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, please be sure to, you know, come for our future meetings. They all, um, you know, we're going to be tackling a lot of issues as well. Alex, um, I just want to check with you, though we had some...